If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Simon Lusk is a seasoned campaigner and David Farrer is a polling expert. Today, they're joining me for a panel discussion about Labour leader Chris Hipkins and what the Labour Party needs to do to become relevant again. Simon and David are both on the line now. Let's get cracking. Okay, so we've got a first here for the crunch, a panel discussion. With me is Simon Lusk. Welcome, Simon. G'day, Cam. You're a political campaigner, lobbyist, and you're going to give us some insights into what on earth is going wrong with Labour at the moment. And then we've got David Farrer, who's a polling genius and uh, a political tragic as well. Welcome, David. Good to be here. Right. So let's just kick this discussion off a little bit with the little contretemps that occurred between Christopher Hipkins and Winston Peters. David, I'll go to you first. What What are your thoughts on that inanity? Well, that's the way well, I see it from Hipkins. What do you think? My constant advice to all MPs, let alone leaders from what you call the two major parties, is never pick a fight with the small party because it's great for them and it's terrible for you. You're meant to be the alternate prime minister taking on the major party of government. And if you're trading insults with the party on 6%, well, that's not going to get you back into government. It's just going to make people think, well, maybe you're a 6% party too. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you know, Hipkins didn't do well out of that engagement. He put out a press release called um, Winston Peters a drunk uncle, and Winston Peters slammed him back and said, you can talk, um, you'd get drunk on a wine biscuit. I mean, how do you recover from that? Well, you just go quiet and move on, basically, because it's one of these things where you think, oh, it's a great scandal, Winston's used some rhetoric which I don't like, etc. But look, voters care about inflation, schools, hospitals. They really don't give a flying F about two politicians critiquing each other's speech. Simon, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's- yeah, we always back Farrah's judgment because he's got the numbers and we're guessing. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I would have exactly the same advice. Ignore Winston. Come out with a policy. You know, if, and if you get into trouble, have a dead cat to throw on the table. Um, you know, but all it did was give Winston another probably 12, maybe 18 hours of news cycle. And likely they'll do something stupid in the house today. And, you know, it's like, come on, guys. Get your act together. This fighting Winston isn't going to win you the next election. Well, I can't remember a politician who's ever got one over Winston when it comes to verbal entanglements. There isn't one that I can remember. Possibly Longy in his day, maybe. No, but, but it was probably a draw, really. To be fair. So, yeah. is this yeah. symptomatic though of where Labor is at that they're? chasing parked cars or any passing car to see if they can get some traction on anything. Is that where they're at at the moment, Simon? I just don't think they've got a strategy. And you know, the, the strategy isn't particularly complex. They've got to work out a way to get to 61 seats in the next parliament. And, you know, I think if you said to Hipkins, mate, how are you going to get to 61 seats? He wouldn't know. Uh, and I don't think anyone in Labour would really know. And I think it's pretty obvious, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Farah. 61 seats for the centre-left probably includes the Greens and the Maoris. Um, must. And, and that really puts Labour in a position where they've got to work out whether they want to cede some ground to the Greens and to the Maori Party and take votes off the right, or whether they want to scrap over a small number of votes on the left. And I don't think they've actually worked that one out either. No, look, they haven't got a strategy or not an apparent one yet. And there's two big things I think they've been doing wrong. And to be fair, they're not the only opposition that does this wrong. Uh, The first thing is no humility. They had the biggest decline in support of any government in history, uh, two-party system. They went from 50 to, was it 26, 27 percent. That's massive. But Hipkins says, oh, I can't think of anything we do differently. Um, They're now spending all their time attacking National for repealing the policies that National vowed to repeal. 
And these are the very policies which is why National won the election, because they are unpopular. So you need to be actually going a bit quiet for your first six, nine months in opposition. You need to be listening. You need to work out what you did wrong. Uh, not just to continue, we were right on everything, um, you know, the people are wrong. I mean, we had um, Grant Robertson come out and saying he wishes he had borrowed more. I mean, just on the weekend, that's what he came out with as his final statement and probably his last media appearance, I wish I'd borrowed more. I mean, the guy was unfit to be a finance minister, absolutely unfit to be a finance minister, probably the worst finance minister since Arnold Normeyer. But maybe even worse than that, because the legacy of his debt is yet to be realised, and they haven't even said sorry. It's like Elton John's song, sorry seems to be the hardest word. Politicians can't seem to say sorry for the mistakes they've made. Yeah, and even if there's a disagreement over you know, policy, the fact is, on some of their major pledges, Kiwi Build, they made 2%. Of their target on a billion trees funded four percent, electric cars fifteen percent, and zero uh, percent for Dunedin hospital rebuild and like right, rail zero percent. You never hear them say, "Well, we had good ideas." They might think that we didn't do well enough in delivering. They just say, "Oh, it's COVID's fault." Well, I mean, that's the funny thing about delivery, isn't it? Remember Jacinda Ardern said that this year is the year of delivery. Well, well it must have been stillborn. Well, I thank you for that because that's why it actually encouraged me to, at the end of the year of delivery, look at how Labour were tracking against their promises. And it became so popular, I now do that every year, and I've just done those stats you just heard, I've just published, that you know, we can now look at their entire six years in office. And again, Jacinda, she promised the two big things were climate change and child poverty. Well, kids and material hardship went up slightly, and greenhouse gas emissions went up. And these were the centre of her political being. And and then you you mentioned about, and Simon mentioned, you need to be able to count to get to 61 seats in Parliament, and you can't get there without the Greens and the Maori Party, both of which seem to have gone completely crazy. Yeah, and look, Labour do, it is a tough decision they have to make because you don't just want to be in government. You do want to be, like, in government with a decent proportion of the vote. And they have lost a lot of Māori votes to Te Pāti Māori, and they've lost the youth vote quite convincingly to the Greens. And they have to either say, as Simon said, do we try and get that back, which will be really hard, because how do you out-radical, you know, Te Pāti Māori talking DNA, genetic superiority, white supremacy, genocide, or the Greens who think it's cruel to... Uh, not let people terrorise their neighbours. So that's not a good strategy. They do have to go for the centre vote, aim for that, but their worry is, well, if we don't get our votes back from the two more left parties, we are remain a party in the 20s. Even if, you know, they gain 3%, they're still going to be on 29%. But isn't there a, you know, I've been around a long time, like you two have, Isn't it best they just ignore the Greens and the Maori Party and that support that went in the last election because they couldn't bring themselves to vote New Zealand First Act or National will just naturally drift back there. And so you're better off just to focus on, you know, to want for want of a better term, the enemy, which is the three governing parties. Yeah, and they also need to work out what their brand is. I I did laugh on election night when Chris Hipkins said, uh, you know, we still remain the party of the worker because (laughs) actually National got more votes from blue-collar voters, according to exit polls I've seen, than Labour did. And that's not new. This is actually happening around the world. So they're not the party of the working class anymore. Are they going to be the party of you know university elites or the party of urban progressives, et cetera? But you, you can't be everything to everyone. Simon, what's your thoughts on that? I just constantly think about what Tony Abbott did in um, – 2010, and he was their third leader in the first term of opposition, and he nearly won. 
And what would Tony Abbott do? I'm pretty sure Tony Abbott would have one look at what's going on and go and have a chat to the Greens and the Maoris and say, you guys get on with it. We're going to leave you alone and we're going to bash the crap out of the uh, governing parties and we'd like your help. We'll coordinate, but that's our game plan. We are just going to absolutely hammer the hell out of the government and make Chris Luxon look really, really, really bad. And we're going to um, try and make ACT look bad. And we're probably going to leave Winston because we might just need him, even though we're saying we don't. But, you know, the first thing I would have done after the election, if I was Hipkins, was send bloody Winston a case of whiskey and say, mate, I got that one wrong, didn't I? And that would make it easy to get to 61. But obviously he is too thick to do that. But it is, you know, Farrah, what do you reckon Abbott would do if he was running Labor here? Well, Abbott was probably the most effective opposition leader we, we've seen. He just focused on the government uh, mercilessly and totally out of favour with the media and the elites. But as you say, he almost did it. And then, of course, he he did win the time after. So he did a couple of things. One was he was true to himself. He never pretended to be anything he isn't. And he ran very good campaign against the government. Of course, the government gave them, you know, uh, they were infighting themselves so much. So no great surprise there. I think though Labour does rather than, rather, of course, they need to attack the government. They also do need to, though, be doing, you know, what you call the sort of listening thing, which is, what did we do wrong? What do people want from us, et cetera? Not the sort of, you know, almost arrogance, yo, there's nothing we would have done differently. They're not so, going to do that until they get a change of leader. And it was Because I'll make a prediction right now. Labour will muddle along until they change their leader, and then they'll get this new leader who will announce to us, with great gravitas as he does it, I'm going to go on a tour around the provinces and I'm going to listen to what people say. They all do it every single time. It's ridiculous. They should be doing it anyway um, when they do their their usually Thursday little trips around the, the country. But they're going to say that, but they're going to waste heaps of time getting there. And then the reason they go, I think that they're going to waste heaps of time getting to that point is that right now they probably can't afford any polling. And so they've got no information other than public polling that's out there. Yeah, that's just bullshit, Cam. Like. Those bastards should go and raise some money and get some proper polling. I mean, they're just useless. If but they've always been going. bludgers, haven't they? I mean, they've but, always you know, piggybacked off Talbot Mills, um, expecting things for free. And the National Party goes and pi- pays for its polling. Yeah, see, I, I disagree a little bit with what Farris said about going out and listening. I don't think that you learn anywhere near as much as listening as if you spend a whole heap of money on proper uh, research. So lots of polling and lots of focus groups. And focus groups are really expensive, but they tell you what the target voters think. And what the the, um, regression analysis fair, would you include that? If you were, you know, if if someone come and said, Pinko, mate, we want you to do all the research for Labor that you can, what's your budget? And gave you a free hand, what would you do? You'd do polling focus groups. Would you do the regression analysis as well? Yeah, absolutely. The regression analysis is what, helps tell you what actually moves the party vote. It's almost the most important part of it, so you're not guessing. And the focus groups, oh, why you do the listening thing isn't so much as an alternative to focus groups, because in focus groups you can really get into the detail, but it's showing a bit of humility, and if you have a new leader especially, it's a chance to introduce them. People are interested in the new leader, et cetera. So it's not that you're going to sit down and analyse the feedback from 50 public meetings, but it's allowing you to get a bit in touch with the community. In Wellington, people get so out of touch, they think everyone is an urban liberal. So part of the reason you do over a tour is actually to talk to normal people. But that's why you do the focus groups too, because they're the ones where you don't just find out what people say on the surface, but you get underneath the why. Why do people feel this? Um, you know, this might be a top tier issue, but is it a second tier issue that they're really concerned about, like law and order? So I'm I'm listening to what I'm hearing in the back channels and to find out how serious I need to take Labour. 
And until they do this detailed research and spend some money and until they fundraise, I'm not taking them that seriously. In the same way that, Farrah, you told me in 2002 when National got a hiding, their polling budget increased. And then in 2017, it went down to almost nothing. And they were f***ed. Like, you know, National were just useless because they didn't have the numbers. And, yeah, I mean... Yeah. I'm pitching for Talbot Mills. They need to go and get a whole lot of money to Talbot Mills to get them to do the, the necessary work. And what I'm hearing is they're not paying Talbot Mills anything. I mean, it's just useless. Yeah. Look, I haven't heard that, and obviously I have a bit of a financial interest in this, but the analogy I use is doing good research is making sure the money you spend on ammo is hitting the right targets. Because if you don't understand what's going to shift voters – then all your other spend can be an absolute waste. And it's not even that. If your brand is crap, if people just don't like you, then it doesn't matter how much money you spend. And the example I always give was the poll Lord Ashcroft did of the Conservatives under Michael Howard's leadership, where he asked people, what do you think of the Conservatives' immigration policy? And around 69% of people loved it. But in another poll, when they were told it's the Conservatives' immigration policy, only 40% of people loved it. So what that told you was their brand was so terrible that doesn't matter how many good ideas they came up with, they weren't going to win. And that's the point at which you say, well, we need to change leaders. Our brand is too tied to an unpopular leader. It's and like that- David Cunliffe, when he was the leader, they came out with these you know, vote positive billboards that didn't mean anything like vote positive, what does that mean? And it was everywhere and they're sort of trying to justify it and then all of a sudden Nikki Hager writes dirty politics and vote positive all of a sudden comes clear that they were hand in glove with each other. But the problem was is they had a leader who was sorry for being a man and he just made a pig's ass of of the entire campaign and Nationals vote actually went up. Got a majority on the night, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like, because I live in you know, way out of big cities and now live in the country, and most people don't know who Nikki Hager is. They certainly don't know who the three of us are. They don't really care about dirty politics or vote positive. You know, they sort of look up: Do I like that person? Are they going to do anything for me? And if not, well, they've probably lost interest. And you know, I think that Jacinda showed that they looked up and said, "Yeah, I do like you." And you know, that made a difference, but the previous leaders hadn't. And that's something that I don't think that um, the people in Wellington, as as Farris just said, you know, the liberal elite in Wellington who think everyone's a trendy urban liberal, well, they're just not. You know, they're, the people I run into, I have a rule in Hawke's Bay, I never talk politics unless someone brings it up with me. And it's very rare for anyone to bring it up with me. They all know what I do, but they're just not very interested. And, mm. you know, that, that's the baseline that you've got to work with. People who really don't care and are not that interested in them. Well, do I like them? Are they competent? Uh, will they do anything for me? And I don't know that Labor could answer those questions. Yeah, in terms of the sort of what you call normal person, I always used to rely on good friends of mine who were parents, and it's what they talk about at school pick-up and drop-off. It used to be what they talk about in the smoko room. And again, since I've become a parent and do the school pickups and drop-offs, People, a lot of people know I'm in politics, do polling, blogging, etc. 99% of the conversations are never about politics. Occasionally, something comes up where people are talking about, like the accommodation allowance we saw recently. And that's how I know when it's got cut through, is when normal people actually start talking about it. But, you know, 99% of them want to talk about the playground, the weather, or how your day went, not, you know, GCSB or um, paying or aura. Is it is part of Labour's problem really that at the moment they literally are um, chasing every passing car uh, and attaching themselves to complex political issues with simplistic arguments? A, a good example would be a referenda on Maori wards. I know I can almost predict what Labor's going to do there. They're going to say that this is de- uh, anti-democratic that um, the government is not is is racist and trying to get rid of them, all that sort of stuff. Is this a, the out-of-touch nature of the Labour Party now, that they just don't actually understand what ordinary people think about these things? 
Well, well, well they can't <laughs> read because they've got to be able to read previous referendum results. I think there's been one successful one, and that was in Wairoa, where the population was 58% Maori. Um, you know, so they're, they're just not very smart. But, but I think the problem on the complex issues is they haven't actually sat down and thought about how the complex issues fit into their strategy and what people are hearing when they start going on about, you know, like the, the referendum on Maori wards is a good example. If they go too far on, on taking the side of an anti-democratic um, Maori wards by right, that's going to piss off a lot of New Zealanders and it'll cost them votes. And, you know, that, that they're going to do something similar. I mean, for how long have they been going on about a capital gains tax and naval gazing over that? I mean, it's just not going to happen. And more importantly... I mean, I don't know anyone that's come and told me they want a capital gains tax. Uh, I've heard plenty of people say, who do I give money to to stop one? Yeah. Uh, so I was going to say, I don't want one, but I want them to propose one because as a former yeah. co-founder of Taxpayers Union, let me tell you, that really gets people worked up. But but I'm sure that ACT, uh, National and New Zealand First, raised vast amounts of money on, on stopping the capital gains tax. But, you know, like, you, you Go to a, a school in, in Hawke's Bay for the school pickup, and no one is talking about the capital gains tax. And you know, why would you spend time talking about that rather than just saying, well, that, no, we're not going to talk about that. That's just nonsense. Let's not talk about dumb stuff and talk about, you know, what is the defining issue of our times? And, and Farrah, probably it's got to have something to do with, with cost of living and, and cost of living in New Zealand. Is, is really linked to excessive regulation that makes everything way too expensive to do. So cost of living, it's really cost of housing, and that's the regulatory environment. How would they solve it? Well, Kiwi Boot was a complete disaster because they're a pack of useless student unionists arguing about stuff. You know, they, they, they needed to fix the planning system and free up a whole lot of land and build a whole lot of houses, and they couldn't get their head around that. Um, well, I don't know. Worse is Phil Twyford did but he then didn't implement his own policy. He <laughs> said, we need to get rid of the rural urban boundary in Auckland. New Zealand Initiative, others all cheered on. Productivity Commission said that artificially you know, multiplies it. And they go into government and then they dropped it. Just, I, I just, it staggers me that people took Phil Twyford seriously at any mm. point. I mean, the guy was just a motor mouth. And I still remember him. You know, this is the thing that annoys me about all politicians is they put on the fluoro vest and the hard hat and the safety glasses and the earmuffs and they walk around jabbering inanely, um, looking stupid. And, and Twyford was terrible at it. He's, you know, he, I remember one TV segment, he was there in his hard hat and his, his uh, fluoro vest saying, oh, look, you've got to have big balls to do what we're going to do. Really? Well, what did you do? What is it, 2%? Or... That you found David on Kiwi Build two percent of two point one, that maybe if we're being generous, yeah, two point one. I mean, it's pathetic. They said they were going to deliver ten thousand houses a year, oh, yeah, but year, ten thousand yeah. houses a year for ten years. Well, they had six years. Where are the houses? Mm. And, and 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 they said, oh, they're going to be affordable homes, and well, that changed, didn't it? Because everything became expensive. Yeah. So, how, but how do you do that? Came to about barking at every car. It does happen to more than one party in opposition. And there's oh, we saw two, National do it multiple times. Yeah, and there's two two reasons for it. One is you think whatever's the issue of the day in Parliament and the House is actually important to people. So you throw out your strategy of we want to talk about education and health. But the other thing is the media do play a bit of a role in this in that they come to you on the issue of the day and unless you're incredibly well disciplined, um, they will take what you say on that issue and ignore what you're trying to talk about. Now, there is a way around that. It is called discipline. It is uh, getting that across. Luxon did quite well when Labour ministers kept imploding, where he kept saying, I don't want to be talking about them. I want to be talking about cost of living, uh, which at least got across. He's not focused on that. And yeah, most most parties in opposition, they're just desperate for something that will chink away at the government. So whatever comes up, you have a go at, but most of them won't work. Well, we're seeing that now, aren't we, with the attacks in the media on Winston 
um, for his State of the Nation, saying that he's comparing co-governance with Nazi Germany. Um, Winston's just sitting there laughing. He's laughing his head off at, at, at this um, at the media doing this. And you mentioned the media come at you with the issue of the day. It's their issue that they want raised. It's not the general public's issue that they want raised. And we've seen how out of touch the media are because they're running campaigns now on social media and just getting absolutely slaughtered. Every time we hear about a media company in trouble and shedding jobs, you can hear the echoes along the streets of celebration at their demise. And they're so out of touch, they don't actually realise we don't like them. Well, I did note that the CTU has launched on their campaign site a sort of Save Our Jobs with all the TVNZ stars, etc. And Rock Door had taken a look at sort of how many signatures it had so far, and it was at around 700 after <laughs> 24 hours. And you'd think saying with all the stars behind it, you would be at 40, 50,000, et cetera. But I think that tells you, yeah, no, no one likes people losing jobs. But as Liam here pointed out, entire swaths of people in the mining, the gas, oil industries have lost their jobs as government have done policies, et cetera. So they don't really see when it's one particular sector that should be held up on a pedestal. Yeah. Well, how are they going to rehab? But I mean, I interviewed uh, Michael Bassett, and he says that the last government was the worst government in living memory. And even when you push him and try and think about all of the governments in New Zealand, no, worse than all of them, how do you recover from that? How do you rehabilitate your party for the, from the impression where a political tragic like Michael Bassett, who was a Labour minister, thinks that the Labour Party were the worst government ever? And aren't they setting National up to run, you know, uh, remember the black budget type campaign for years and years and years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Labor's problem will be when they attack the government on health education stats, everyone's going to remember how much worse despite the extra spending under them. Look, there will be a leadership change and we just have to look at the history of MMP. National in 2002 was in the 20s. And then they changed to Don Brash and they went up to high through his 40s. Labour spent their entire opposition in the 20s. And then Jacinda came in and she shot them up to high through his 40s. And National, to be fair, was actually polling well under Simon Bridges, but then combination of COVID response and his personal favourability, they dropped to 30s and 20s, and they stayed there pretty much in the 20s until Christopher Luxon came in. And again, if you look at all three of them, it's quite interesting because the three or four who really made a difference were Brash and Key and Jacinda and Luxon. And most of them weren't your typical politicians. Key and Luxon and Brash were also seen as people who made their careers outside politics and were now coming in to serve. Well, Jacinda had a phenomenal communications ability, popularity, etc. So Hipkins will go, no doubt. Um, probably the replacement Cepaloni because she's the only one who hasn't been involved in scandal who's quite competent and she is the deputy leader. But is she going to be enough of a turnaround to not be associated with the last government? Probably not. So really it's going to be, have they either got a star on the back bench like Camilla Bellich or Arena Williams, or is there someone going to come in next time who's their potential leader who can get people to look at them again? Simon, what yeah, are your Sarah. thoughts on that? Can they be re rehabilitated simply by changing to Carmel Cipollone? Uh, well, I think that if she went and spent a few years or a few months working out what Tony Abbott did and then got out and raised the money to do the proper polling and came up with a nice set of four slogans to bash National with, I think she has a chance. I just don't think she's got a clue and she won't do it. And yeah. what Simon said about some slogans, yeah, and Winston's usually very good at this, people will remember around three things max. Sometimes, you know, pledge cards have five or seven, but really three or four. So you need to, again, do the research, but work out what are the three issues we're going to campaign on for the next election. 
and hammer them for two years. Uh, not change them every month, et cetera, but work it out. 12 months should be enough to do that. And then make that your brand, that we're the people who are going to fix the school system or you know improve the health system, however you do that. But again, their problem is all the stats went backwards under them. So they have to pick ones that have believability. Yeah, I mean, if you say you're going to fix the school system, then I can see National more likely act uh, piping up in the house and saying, what do you mean fix the school system? Under the school system that you were running, we had um, attendance levels of 40% at schools, and now we've got attendance levels at 75%. Uh, we've already fixed it. We don't need you. Thanks very much. Just a big problem. Um, they're going to run into those. But you know, I think that if we were running the campaign and, and for Carmel and she was saying, okay, well, how do we do it? So, yeah, look, we got it wrong. Those policies weren't good enough, and we made it sure that a whole lot of poor brown kids missed out on a decent education. And under my watch, that's not going to happen. Whānau across the country are going to get educated, and if we've got to punish their parents for not sending their kids to school, we will. And under my watch, all New Zealanders are going to get a great education. May work, but they'll probably end up with the teachers' union going spastic at her, and, and she'll back down. And, oh, well, it's not the parents' fault that the kids don't go to school. And so, well, that's just bull****. Like, everyone thinks that kids should go to school, and that if they don't, it's the parents' fault. Just come out and say... We are cutting off opportunity for poor brown New Zealanders because we don't make sure they get a decent education. And that would resonate, uh, but I don't think Labor has got it in them to say it. Well, no, they're more focused on things like accusing the government of being anti-democratic for using urgency when they used it themselves. It's just nonsense. You know, it's like no one cares. Um, you know, uh, Farrah, what do you reckon? Do you reckon 1% of New Zealand would understand what parliamentary urgency is? Oh, it might be four or five percent but yes it's not a, a, a big issue and as cam said you know chris hipkins moved 24 different bills and one motion under urgency as leader of the house um there what simon said though is so right and it goes back to and simon of course has studied hundreds of campaigns professionally but what bill clinton called triangulation which is you do something which people don't expect from you, they pay attention, and it wedges your opponents to. If Labour came out saying, we're going to increase fines for truancy, National suddenly either look weak for not agreeing, or they'll say, we'll do it too, and then they look like they're following. So to get people's attention, you do have to go the something that will surprise people. Come, saying we now agree with the Greens on a capital gains tax or a wealth tax isn't going to surprise anyone. That might get them votes from Greens and Te Pahi Māori, but it's not going to get them votes in the centre. Well, get them votes from Martin Bradbury, Simon Wilson and um, Russell Brown, but that's about it. Yeah, it's just not, not going to work. Yeah, Cam, I think that the, and as something that, that Farris mentioned also, you know, but they can't defend their COVID record as being perfect and they're stupid to try. You know, they should have some humility and say, well, maybe we got some things wrong. Maybe we should have adopted more of a Swedish model. What would we do differently next time? Rather than, oh, no, we were great in COVID. You should all just love us because of how great we were. And it's worse than that, though, Simon, because you had Hipkins come out and say nobody was forced to take the jab. Well, that's just, just a lie. Yeah, and... <laughs> You know, like we, we're now got a, a shortage in the health system because they still won't let a whole lot of unvaccinated people back in. The and military, in defence, it's nuts. They, they could say, look, yeah, that was a mistake. We should reinstate them all. And that would send a message that they reflected and shown some humility. And uh, for the life of me, I can't understand now why you wouldn't want guys back in the military just because they didn't have the jab. But yeah. the military have lost in the high court and in the Court of Appeal on the mandates that they forced on their staff. And you would have thought they would have given up on doing that, but oh no, they've announced they're now going to the Supreme Court to overturn the Court of Appeal. Well, the chances of that happening are almost zero. I mean, they've categorically lost in the in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal, but they're still going. It's like they've forgotten there was a change of government. Oh, and Labor have, have forgotten that they're losing in the court of public opinion because they are defending the indefensible. I mean, it, it went too far. It worked for a while. And pretty much fair, I think I'm right in 
saying everywhere in the world there was a big increase in the polling for the government at the beginning of any COVID response. And then it fell away rapidly when people were looking around going, well, this is just bullshit. You know, I'm not that sick. Uh, and we don't need to lock down our whole economy. And where Sweden took a much more pragmatic approach where they didn't get sucked in with models that said, oh, lots of people will die because Swedish people were just a bit sensible and took some responsibility so they didn't kill their economy. And you know, that's something that Labour could come out and say, look, we got some things wrong and if there was another pandemic, we would do it differently. I think that's really important because the reality is if there was another pandemic, the social licence has gone. There is no way that people would now accept six weeks under house arrest at home, only able to to, to walk to the beach, et cetera. There's no way people would accept, you know, jobs uh, going, employers closing for two months. And most of all, I understand even Labour ministers have now acknowledged this, would we close the schools? The evidence is massive that closing schools was the wrong thing to do because once the kids are out of that education system, it's so hard to get them back in. There's been some great peer reviews between states and the US. So, yeah, there's some stuff they did very well, to be fair, during COVID, but what they don't yeah, understand... marginalising people and demonising. Sorry, Cam? Yeah, what they did really well was marginalise and demonise people. Yeah. Well, no, there are, are other things in terms of we were fortunate that we managed to keep the COVID out when there wasn't... Uh, when it was a far more lethal strain, and I think that was very beneficial uh, there. But there's a percentage of the population who feel very aggrieved. They lost their jobs, their livelihoods, and this isn't a one-off for them. And Labour has to find a way to say, here's what we did right, but we do regret this. Because these people aren't going to forget it for one term or two terms. No, forever. Um, We're not going to forget it forever. You know, there, there's people that are listening to this show will be sitting here nodding their head and going, I'm never going to let those guys forget what they did to my, me, my family, my business, everything else. And especially what, what was done to Auckland. You know, they've tacitly, quietly ad- admitted, the Labour Party, that perhaps we locked down Auckland for a bit too long. You know, instead of actually saying, well, we shouldn't have done that. The anger in Auckland still with the Labour Party for those lockdowns is palpable. And, and that's a thing that they can easily do well uh, coming back from and being saying, showing some humility to say, look, we got locking down Auckland wrong and we got locking down Auckland wrong because we decided we wanted to prop up hotels by having quarantine in Auckland, our biggest commercial centre. And New Zealand first policy was to fly them all into army bases or air force bases, have temporary accommodation and, and have them quarantine there. So if COVID escaped, it didn't cause the biggest um, economic engine in New Zealand to, to close. Um, and I mean, from an economic perspective, that makes sense because it was costing about a billion dollars a week to close Auckland. But from a straight polling perspective, I, I'm pretty sure I remember you telling me, Farrah, that Labor, that was at the third lockdown, their vote just tanked. So they were down around what the Greens were getting. And they got it wrong politically. It just killed them. Yeah, like the, the, I remember complaining to an Auckland friend about the lockdown in Wellington and my friend just went, you only had one, shut the F up. <laughs> we had five or something. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It, 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 you know, there's never been any critical analysis of the spending that they allowed under all of these COVID provisions. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. There was multi-millions of dollars spent on laptops so that kids could distance learn using Zoom or whatever. They rolled all this out. Thousands and thousands and thousands of laptops were going to school kids. Well, where the hell are they now? They were given to those people. Where are they? Right. What about the millions of dollars at rack rates that the government was paying to all the motels and hotels around Auckland to run the MIQ? They weren't paying discounted rates for bulk buyout of of underutilised resources, they were paying full rack rate. And on top of that, there was restitution clauses to repair all the damage from all the scumbags that were in these places. So, it's you know, how do they recover from that? Because someone should dig into that stuff, and those are golden handcuffs to hang the Labour persistently on 
over ridiculous, unaccounted for spending. But the Labour Party seems to have this innate ability to say that all spending is good spending. No, they've just got to come out and say, we got some things badly wrong, and if it happened again, we would do it differently. Well, this is what they, we would do differently. And if they, they don't say I thought one of the better things the government's done is expand the terms of reference or the consulting on it for mm. the Royal Commission because the current terms of reference were basically just going to be a once-over, uh, no real scrutiny of government decisions. But what they're proposing, I think Brooke Van Velden's uh, the lead on this, is to actually ask those hard questions uh, mm. about what went right, wrong, what should we do differently. And Labour, if I were them, would want to come to my own conclusions and get them out with a bit of a mea culpa first, rather than wait for the Royal Commission to come out where a lot of people probably won't realise that Rao, everyone's happy we had a relatively low death toll, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, the delays in the vaccine rollout, when they promised we'd be first in, in the queue, and many, many other things. Um, I think biggest scandal was the testing, where they refused to do the saliva testing just because they were in a huff with the company behind it, et cetera. And that could have opened up businesses and universities um, overnight, basically. So there's going to be, I suspect, some pretty damning stuff come out. Well, the banning of ivermectin and other cheap things like vitamin D3 and stuff like that, which which has been shown multiple times now in peer-reviewed studies to have been a good prophylactic way to, to, to treat COVID-19. Yeah, look, Cam, that was a scandal. I don't think that that's the real big thing because, you know, like, I know you go on about that, but I don't know anyone else that does. And I think that the really big stuff that they got wrong was, you know, MIQ in Auckland, um, the mandates were way too harsh. And, you know, Hipkins forgot to order the f-ing vaccines for six weeks. So we were all locked down for longer. I mean, but it was someone else's it? fault. It was someone yeah, else's fault. But he, he was the Minister of COVID Recovery. And, and I just couldn't believe that, that you know, they weren't ads. When he became Prime Minister, if, if I had been running National's campaign, the moment he came out, i go, this bastard forgot to order the COVID vaccines. You can't expect him to run the country yes. and, you know, just mock him for all his failures, which were many, many fold by the time he became Prime Minister. Well, and- you look at all his portfolios that he held, Minister of Police, it went backwards. Minister of Education went backwards. COVID recovery backwards. Everything he did. Like, hell, he is the reverse Midas. He has the literal poo finger. Everything he touched leads a smear of poo on it. And um, and that's just Hipkins. But all they've got to replace him that you guys can come up with is Carmel Cipollone. Is there anyone else? Well, uh, Camilla Balich looks the part, and that counts for a lot. Uh, I don't know whether she's necessarily got the support of the the party, which isn't a bad thing. But, you know, Labor found the biggest donkey they possibly could find and put her in Mount Albert, nearly lost it to the Greens. I mean, that that is a seat that three... Nearly lost Labor it to Melissa Lee. Yeah, <laughs> it's just just useless. Um, and, yeah, you know, they they really did pick a donkey instead of someone with a bit of talent. And, you know, I don't know that Camilla is that talented, but she certainly looks the part, and you'd think that with her CV being as strong as it is compared to most of the people, you know, it's not as if she was a diversity officer at a university. She's actually a lawyer. Um, I mean, I guess she was also, also a diversity officer at her university students. <laughs> <laughs> she was the woman's rights officer. But uh, no, like I, I, I rate her, but she hasn't held even junior ministerial roles. She's an unknown. Uh, I think she, she'll need time in the opposition to, to prove herself. People talk to Karen, and I like Karen. If he won his seat, I think there would be the case to be made this guy's relatable, he's popular, he's electable. But he got trounced in his seat. Um, and that makes it hard to say the guy who got kicked out of his seat and is now a list MP is the messiah who's going to lead us back because he's so relatable. Yeah, um, that'd be nah. Yeah, well, I just don't know that he actually is that relatable, is he? No, I mean... Sure, he's got a bit of fight in him. He'd certainly have more fight than Camilla Balich. But, yeah, I just don't rate him. He he just, well, here's the thing, right? I look at people and they know they're not being filmed, but they are being filmed. Um, they just are comfortable with themselves. 
And Kieran McInerney is a guy who walks around with playing pocket billiards. He's always got his hands in his pockets. I'll add that so does Christopher Luxon. It's something he needs to stop doing, <laughs> right? But my grandfather always used to say, never trust a man with his hands in, on his balls all the time. And he's right. You, you just look at him and you think, you're sloppy. You've always got your hands in your pockets. You always look like the wreck of the Hesperus. Um, you look at your vehicle. Sure, it's an old ute, but it just looks tatty. As even his beard looks tatty. That might seem petty and childish to say that, but it's the blink test. If you look at somebody and you think, oh, oh no, then well, you're not going to get elected. We all know if he shaves his beard off, it's all on, or he tidies it up. Well, he can't really lose it, afford to lose any more weight, does he? He's almost got the body of a half suck throaty. So, well, what, we can't find any any realistic leadership things. No, but we can look at some metrics because I don't think that anyone really thought that Tony Abbott, despite being a Rhodes Scholar, was going to come in and absolutely smash up Rudd so badly that Labor got rid of Rudd. Um, I think that it is possible to see someone that is determined to um, to copy Abbott's playbook. And, you know, we've already talked about polling. The other thing that I'm looking at is fundraising. And if they're serious about being Prime Minister, they will get out and they will raise a shitload of money and they will be able to fight national with a huge budget. And the budget will start off with research and then it'll be the staff and to get out the vote and just running a good comprehensive campaign, hammering their three or four messages, many slogans. And when the donation returns start coming in, you've got to look for who are the big donors, and there probably won't be any because Labor think asking for money is beneath them. Um, the unions, well, the unions don't give much because they're just a bit useless here. It's not like in the US where they fund the Democrats. And you never really know what's going on with the small donors, but you hear in the back room what's going on with the small donors, and it's usually not much. And it's, people will say, oh, well, Labor can't go and raise money for, from big donors. Like, well, that's just bullshit. Well, Mike but, Williams did. Fat Tony was good at shaking uh, down um, was a- you know, money, and, and he, he – um, they should actually go and give them a call and say, look, how about you and Bob Harvey, who who were good fundraisers for the Labor Party, how about you two get together and and um, and go and raise us, you know, half a million dollars to start with? Mike Williams should be able to shake down half a million dollars with about three phone calls. I would have thought so. I mean, I know some of the hardest right businessmen in, in New Zealand who have huge respect for Fat Tony. I mean, they just love him because while they didn't agree with his politics and they are a bit scared that he's going to bash them if they did anything wrong, he always got back to them. He always treated them with dignity. He would find stuff out. He managed them properly. And he was a great fundraiser. Clark didn't really have any problem with fundraising. And, you know, they, they go, oh, well, you know, Fat Tony, well, he's in the distant past. Well, yeah. They're not so distant fast. Stu Nash was able to raise a shitload of money, but, you know, he, he played rugby, drank beer, root, root, rooted women. Labor didn't really like him, so they didn't use his fundraising ability. Well, so did Louisa Wall, but they didn't like her either. No, nah, yeah, a common <laughs> theme. <laughs> Message if you're an aspiring Labor candidate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they should be able to go out and get money. I mean, Farrah, you built the taxpayers' union with a few others. You raise more than the political parties in New Zealand most of the time anyway, don't you? And all well, eighty percent small dollar donations too. Yeah. If you get a brand that we're going, you're going to fight for what you believe in, and you actually will get results. People can disagree with you on some stuff, but they'll donate to you for the stuff that they yeah see you're effective on. Well, that's a good point. You've got to be um, visible on issues that mean something to people. And it seems that Labor is not visible on issues that mean things to people. I mean, let's just run through a thing, uh, a, a few of them, and you know, let's see what you guys think. Where should their position be on these? Is should they be in favour, against, or um, indifferent? I mean, I think that's the, those are the three things. But and then we'll see what Labor actually is. So let's let's just run through a list. Let, let's kick off with well, Palestine, indifferent, right? no, indifferent. You say. Simon, uh, David, what do you say? Yep, and different too. It's uh, not an issue that's going to determine any votes in New Zealand. It will get people worked up who think strongly on one side or the other, but you're not getting people shifting votes on it. And I agree with that. I mean, for most people, I mean, I'm not one of them, but um, most people think, well, it's over there and it doesn't affect us, so we shouldn't really be 
talking about this, but Labour and the Greens are donkey deep on one side of that issue, so they're getting that one wrong. What about electric cars? David, you're a, you're an EV fan. You've even got one. Yep, I yeah, no, no, my second electric car, actually. Um, and look, I do think that climate change, you know, in the polling, it's normally a third-tier issue, usually 5%, sometimes if it's in the news, 10%. And certainly in Wellington, but we're about unusual, you know, you're seeing a big uptake in electric cars. So it is an issue you need to be out on and have a policy on, but is not a, a top tier issue. It's not like, can I afford to buy groceries? Do I have a good hospital? Do I have a good school? The reality is with electric cars is that traditional Labour voters can't afford them. So it's not an issue that you should be, you know, betting the bank on. Do you agree well, with that, Simon? Yeah, and not only that, The Economist, and if there's anyone literate in Labor, they should be reading The Economist to find out what's happening in the rest of the world. They had this wonderful article about how the um, Greens around Europe, then vote has fallen away. The more the climate change affects the population, uh, the less votes the Greens get because the green solution is to tax us all more and not to mitigate. And for some reason, voters are sensible and they don't like paying more for stuff that makes bugger all difference so they just well we're not going to vote for you if i was running labor's campaign yeah i think electric cars are okay if you want them but i'm here to talk about how you put your school lunch in your kids lunch box and afford it and can pay down your, your mortgage or pay your rent it's not electric cars it is very very much a elite income earning um issue whether you can have an electric car, even if you want one, if you're poor, you can't have one because they're too expensive. Well, you touch on global warming there as well. I mean, there's this big push for having global warming solutions. Um, my anecdotal evidence around ordinary New Zealanders is no one gives a stuff about it. In fact, you know, I, I always joke that I think people, you know, would welcome the ability to grow mangoes and pineapples in their back garden, even in Invercargill. I don't know what the other side break quote about climate change uh, and he said when it's a moral issue we lose on it when it's an economic issue we win on it and to a degree you saw that with the last Labour government they talked the talk on it but then uh, after the regional fuel tax didn't prove popular Jacinda announced there were no more regional fuel taxes ever 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 in my time as Prime Minister uh, because and I resigned that wasn't popular. And there were a couple of other ones where they backflipped on it. Everyone, you know, wants a good environment and can have a concern about the climate. But if your solution is to tax people thousands of dollars more a year so they can't afford, you know, shopping, then that's not going to be popular. Right. And what about mining? Shooting one in five cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we all do our bit for climate change by eating steak, don't we? <laughs> mining. We all know Labor's position on mining. They don't want it, which is <laughs> ironic considering they were founded on the West Coast in a mining community. And, and I think this is one where they need to be indifferent. They're not going to win any votes um, from National on mining. They're going to win votes off the Greens um, and perhaps the Maori Party, and they should be leaving those parties to to fight that fight and they should be taking the fight to national and areas where they can win and they um, get to that 61 votes in parliament after the 2026 election and I just for the life of me can't see how getting upset about mining is going to get them to 61 votes and what well, are you also goes back to what we were just talking with electric cars if you do think electric cars are a big part of the future, and I do because I believe in markets, and I do think that the costs of them will come down over time uh, as you get economies of scale. But you know what? They need lots of parts from mines. You know, mm -hmm. you need a massive amount of mining to produce batteries for electric cars. There's absolutely no alternative way around it. There's not substitutes for them. Uh, so... You know, you can understand some people can be against coal mining because, you know, of greenhouse gases, but the people who are zealots who say nothing should ever be dug up out of the ground, well, I guarantee you they have a cell phone. <laughs> we all know what the cell phone's made out of, metals. Mm. 
So yeah, they should be indifferent at the least on mining. Okay, what about the latest thing that's hit the news when we were hearing lots of wailing from the left about these scumbag state house tenants that are that are housed by the world's uh, worst uh, landlord, I think you um, dubbed them as, or maybe New Zealand's worst landlord, Kaing Aura. I think it's a sister soldier moment. They need to come out and smack the shit out of them. You know, these, these scumbags are wrecking places, they're stabbing people, they're horrible to live next to. It's a privilege to get subsidised housing and they don't deserve it. You know, if, if they end up having to spend a few weeks living under a bridge uh, because they can't behave properly. I think most New Zealanders are in favour of them spending that couple of weeks under the bridge so they learn their lesson. And I don't think that we should be paying for it. Um, and, you know, Farrah talked about Clinton's triangulation. That's another, it's just an opportunity to come down, not on the side that they are at the moment, but on the other side. We got that one wrong. Just allowing people to behave badly didn't work. We've got to change our policy. It was interesting they've been a bit muted to the government's policy change that's come out. They've just sort of said, well, you need to also look at this. Well, the Greens, of course, have called it evil and that that somehow evicting gang members who terrorise their neighbours is, is evil. I think leaving them there is evil. Um, but you know, look, if you ask, I haven't actually done polling on this because you don't need to, but I'd say 80 to 90% of New Zealanders, if you ask them, do you think a state house tenant who constantly terrorises their neighbours should be evicted uh, from their state house, massive overwhelming support. You probably get quite good support for saying, should these people be taken outside and shot? I mean, it's, it's just how far the average person thinks it is wrong. And Labor look wrong on this issue, morally wrong. Scumbags shouldn't get away with being scumbags. And they're saying, yes, they should. And that's what the average voter is thinking. Labor wants these scumbags to be allowed to be scumbags, and it just shouldn't happen. And 80 or 90%, I think you're probably close at 90 than 80, thinking that they should be treated with contempt and punished for their stupidity and their bad behaviour. Which comes down to school lunches then. Labor's on the wrong side of this one too, aren't they? Uh, not so sure on that. I think... Putting aside the economics of it, uh, and also, I guess, the philosophical point, it is potentially an issue where you can get some cut through with the public, because a bit like apple pie, do you want your kids to be well fed? Do you want them hungry at school? The case against is a bit more complicated because you have to say, well, actually, though, it's the parent's job to do it. You make the problem worse by actually uh, not solving the problem of parents who, who don't prioritise their kids having food. But I do think on the school lunches one, there is one where they, they may get some traction. Farrah, in like, my memory of, of the people that objected to the useless parents the most were the hardworking blue-collar parents who were doing their best just to keep it, their head above water and to look after their kids properly. Is that the case on the school lunches? Like, the three of us are pretty comfortably off. We don't really care one way or another, but if we were doing two jobs and you know, our wife was doing one and, and, and the kids had to kick in while they're still at school to help the family out, and they're seeing their scumbag neighbours who play spaces all night and send their kids to school without the right uniforms and, you know, without lunch and uh, uh, taking just complete bludgers, that should be vote. The, the working people should be the ones that Labor are targeting, isn't it? They, they're oh, the ones. Working class people are probably got the hardest views on welfare fraud, just as the people who are most against the bad Kayanga or a residents are the many good ones. They're mm -hmm. the ones who who suffer the most there. And yes, with school lunches, it does tend to be that the concern comes from people who who actually, you know, sort of the liberal elite again, because they just see these poor people, we have to, we can't expect them to actually look after their kids. If you're poor, you know, you can't be expected to actually have self-respect and and focus on your kids. And they, you know, can't handle, I think, the philosophical thing about, well, why stop at school lunches? Why, why not school dinners and school breakfasts? I mean, if, you know, kids are going hungry, why shouldn't the state be responsible for feeding every child? 
here's a here's a thing that kills the school lunches argument dead in five seconds. Who fed the kids during the lockdowns? <laughs> there you go. And see, school holidays. And school holidays. You guys are speechless, right? In school holidays and in the lockdowns, who fed the kids? Their parents did. Yeah, and but I, was on I the wrong side of that one. It's an interesting philosophical argument, and I tend to come down on the side as a taxpayer. I'd rather the kids were in school getting educated rather than not in school and behaving badly. And so I'm willing to pay for some of them to have lunch. As much as I object to it, I'm willing to. But I think it does. This is where Labor could take a very strong moral stand and say, look, we just think this is right or we think it is wrong. We stand for these things and we're going to keep standing for them but at the moment, I don't know what Hipkin stands for. I mean, that guy, what does he stand for? He stands for not liking Winston, not being that competent. What else? He's been around forever. I mean, what's the word cloud for Hipkins, Farah? I uh, haven't done one lately. Uh, would be interested. Okay, last issue, transgender. Look, I, I'm going to mention a, a very, very competent and informative British author called Matt Goodwin who has all the data on all the issues in Britain and saying how far the liberal elite and the luxury belief class are out of touch with people, average voters. And the trans stuff is the prime example where it's, it's something like 80% of Britons don't believe that biological males should be allowed in biological female-only spaces. They don't believe that you should be able to change your gender uh, with three months' notice, self-identifying. It's just, you know, and there's so few of them. It's just gone too far, and it's really not an issue that is going to win Labor the next election. So like, just leave it alone. They should be indifferent to it and concentrating on you know, the, the kitchen table issues. And whether we allow men to compete against women in women's sport, just... So I just think that's wrong, totally wrong. Yeah, and I think that probably 80% of New Zealanders do. And if you think otherwise, they think, well, you're not fit to be in government if you can't work that out. But if you don't know whether you're Arthur or Martha, I mean, how can we expect you to run a ministry? I think the trans activists, as I call them, it's been incredibly sad. It's probably the biggest own goal I've seen in community sentiment because up until the last few years where there was the zealotry that you can't have a discussion about it, I think most people were very tolerant of trans individuals. Look, I know, I couldn't even count how many I know, but there's some amazing people I know who are trans. I've also met a beautiful Indian woman who told me she was originally a male, etc. And she's living her life. No one knows. She doesn't make a fuss about it. She's, you know, had the operation, done the change. So we had, I think, actually great tolerance. But then when you come out and you say, you must support us on everything. You must support puberty blockers for children. You must support, no matter what the sport is or the league, uh, people being able to compete based on their gender identity rather than their sex. When you say you can't debate these issues, the vast majority of people have now just said, oh, well, my attitude's again harder on this. No, stuff you. And so I think it's a terrible own goal uh, because... I think you can have huge empathy for people with gender dysphoria who are trained and they should be left to live their lives as they want to, but also be able to just say, look, there are a few areas, you know, if you're in prison and, and you're, you're, you're a rapist and you're a biological male, there is real concerns for you in a woman's prison. You can also accept, though, that if someone's genuinely transgender, like, take an example, Georgina Barr, the former MP, lovely person, if she for some reason had been sent to prison, yeah, I would say, look, it should it'd be wrong to put her into a men's prison. She's been living life as a woman for 40 years. But what it comes down to is you need a bit of flexibility. You need governments and that to be able to say, OK, here's how we'll deal with the situation. But the trans activists pull out the... If you have any debate on this, we're going to commit suicide. <laughs> you know, you, you're threatening our identity. You want to eradicate us. And that's not the case. It's just that 
there are challenges. So yeah, I, I just find it incredibly sad and probably the biggest political on goal. Same-sex marriage, which I campaigned for, how they got that through was by being tolerant, by saying, you can have your beliefs, but this is about allowing people who love each other to marry. Why would you want to stop that? But on the trans issue, they've gone for such an aggressive uh, lobby, you know, where J.K. Rowling, you know, is of hissed and demonised, it, and of course, it doesn't stop. I mean, the big thing you find out is you have all the people on Twitter saying this is terrible. And then she releases a video game that becomes the biggest selling video game of all time. So sorry, that's me going on about. But yeah, it just pisses me off, actually, how badly this issue has been handled by the activists. See, I, I was a big fa- I wasn't a big fa- fan of gay marriage because I believed not all this <laughs> hocus pocus about love and everything else. I just thought everybody deserves a mother-in-law. <laughs> I think the phrase was, or the slogan was, "Anyone stupid enough to want a mother-in-law deserves one." Yeah, um, yeah. No, but Kim, the the uh, once again, if if someone in Labor is taking the time to read and think about these issues, UK Labor maybe six months ago came out and said, "Look, I think on trans issues." we've gone a little bit too far in favour of inclusion and and at the expense of fairness. And we need to edge back towards more fairness. Mm. We want to be inclusive, but we've got to be fair. And that means we can't have women sport being dominated by biological males. Fairness means, yes, you are trans, it's unfortunate, but some things are going to be difficult and some things are difficult for everyone. We all have problems in our lives that just different. So do you want the very, very, very tiny number of biological males that want to compete against women and win, or do you not? And you know, I think that Labor need to ask that question. Where is the balance between inclusion and fairness? As you say, it's a balance. Like, you know, on the sporting issue, you can't have both inclusion and fairness. No. But it's not There's a reason. Right Otherwise, we wouldn't have male case. and female competitions, would yeah. we? We wouldn't have them. No. We'd have everybody to compete against each other and I'll look all the yeah. first, second and third of men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's things such as you just have an open category, but I actually think you can have a more nuanced approach, which is at school community level, I wouldn't have a problem that people play with their gender identity as long as it's physically safe because I actually think if you're a 15, 16-year-old, it is really important not to be felt shunned or isolated. But when you get to professional sport, when you get to the Olympics, then I think, yeah, have to be very strict on the biological thing. So again, I think you should be able to have a reasonable debate about where you draw the line. But the activist community will say any drawing of the line anywhere is bigoted. And that just turns people off. Okay, we're going to wind up this um, little discussion that we've had about how screwed Labor is. Give us a 30-second summary, each of you. Start off with you, David. A 30-second summary on what Labor you think Labor needs to do to start being credible again. Uh, Hipkins should go in around 12 months, 18 months before the election is probably quite good for a new leader. They need to pick the three things they're going to campaign on, start doing the policy work on those. They'll need a signature policy that's exciting, but also isn't typical, not one you just would normally expect from them. And they need to be disciplined. They need to just focus on the core messages, not keep sniping, not getting into fights with Winston. Simon? You've got to work out how to get to 61 votes. They want to get Tony Abbott's playbook. They want to make sure that they fundraise properly and they want to spend heavily on research. And when we know that they're doing those things, we'll start taking them seriously. Until then, we'll just think, well, you guys are probably not going to come back. Yeah, I I agree with both of you on that. Uh, We need to have a strong opposition. And right now, Labor is not a strong opposition. They're all over the place, as I keep saying, chasing passing cars. And uh, one day they're going to chase a car and it's going to stop and they're going to run into the back of it at 100 miles an hour. But we do need a strong opposition. We saw what happens when you have a strong government with a weak opposition. And I don't think we want a repeat of of the years between 2020 and 2023. And on that note, guys, I thank you very much for coming on The Crunch again. And uh, hopefully the Labour Party will listen to us, but more likely they won't. Thanks a lot.
between the three of us in that discussion, there must have been around 90 years of experience in campaigning and polling. Now, I don't think for a second the Labour Party will ever listen to us, but they should. Let me know your thoughts about my chat with Simon and David by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.